Welcome to Module 6 of DLS 105, Demonstration of RMC Total Risk. RMC Total Risk is a quantitative risk analysis software that can be used to perform risk calculations for dam and levee safety risk assessments. Although this presentation will not fully cover all the features and capabilities of the RMC Total Risk software, after this presentation, participants should be able to demonstrate how to use RMC Total Risk to perform the calculations for most risk assessments. We'll start by covering the graphical user interface before stepping through four risk analysis examples, which will cover how to set up a standard risk assessment, gate inoperability, debris blockage, and seismic potential failure modes. Let's start with the graphical user interface. The graphical user interface consists of a menu bar, a toolbar, and four window panes. The Project Explorer window pane is used to view, navigate, and organize project elements. It shows a graphical representation of the hierarchy of elements within your project. Elements are organized under the hazards, transforms, system responses, consequences, and risk analyses folder subheaders. Menu commands related to each element can be viewed and selected by right-clicking on the folders in the Project Explorer window. For example, to add a tabular hazard, right-click on the Hazards folder and select Add Tabular Hazard from the menu. You will then be prompted to name the new function. Once added, it will appear in the Tab Documents window. The tab documents provides the editing and reviewing space for the various project components, including hazard, transform, response, and consequence functions. The documents can be dragged by their tabs and can be pinned to different areas on the screen, or they can be free floating. These actions can also be performed by right clicking on the document tab. In RMC Total Risk, you can customize the position, size, or behavior of windows to create window layouts that work best for you. When you customize the layout, RMC Total Risk will remember your configuration and it'll take on the same configuration the next time you open the program. The View menu allows you to unhide or open the window panes within the software. An option is also listed in the View window to restore the default layout shown here. RMC Total Risk contains four function types that are very similar to the functions that you learned about in Module 1 of this course. Hazard functions describe the exceedance probabilities of various hazard levels, with examples being peak flow frequency, reservoir pool stage frequency, and seismic hazard curves. Hazard functions are almost always represented by continuous random variables. Transform functions are used to transform or convert the hazard levels from one type of a function to another. An example would be converting a peak flow frequency function into a stage frequency function using a flow to stage rating curve. System response functions describe the conditional probability of failure for various hazard levels for potential failure modes. And finally, consequence functions describe the consequences of failure or non-failure for various hazard levels. For a given project in RMC Total Risk, the required functions for a risk analysis are hazard, system response, and consequence functions. Transform functions are optional inputs and are based on the specific requirements of the project. To demonstrate how to set up the different functions and a risk analysis, let's step through several examples. The data used to set up the risk analysis in the RMC Total Risk will come from the Module 6 Exercises and Homework file, which can be downloaded from the course website. The first example illustrates the basic steps to setting up a risk analysis for multiple hydrologically driven potential failure modes. The hydrologic hazard is represented by a stage frequency curve and is provided in tabular format. Relationships for the 5th percentile, 50th percentile, and 95th percentile annual exceedance probabilities are provided for each stage. To begin building the model, 
Add a tabular hazard function by right-clicking on the Hazards folder in the Project Explorer window and selecting Add Tabular Hazard. RMC Total Risk also provides the user the option to pull in hazard data directly from other RMC developed tools such as BestFit and RFA. Name the hazard function in the prompt and click OK. Use the first drop-down to change the uncertain variable to probability and the second drop-down to select per percentile Z as the distribution. In the Properties window, verify that the hazard type and units are correct and select the Interpolation Transforms. For the stage frequency curve, the hazard type is stage, the units are given in feet, and we want to transform the probabilities to normal Z variant when interpolating. Next, copy and paste the hydrologic hazard table from the homework file. and paste it into the RMC Total Risk table. The software will plot the stage frequency inputs and the calculated mean. Next, because the risk analysis includes a potential failure mode that is a function of spillway discharge, PFM2, we need to transform to convert stage to spillway discharge. Right-click on the Transform folder and select Add Tabular Transform. A prompt will appear for you to name the Tabular Transform. Now that a deterministic table has been added, copy the Stage to Spillway Discharge data from the homework file. And paste it into the table on the screen. Review the plot and verify that the transform properties in the property window are correct. The hazard type should be stage with units of feet. The transformed hazard will be flow with the units of CFS. You can customize this plot in any plot in RMC Total Risk by right clicking on either axis or in the middle of the plot area. For the interpolation transforms, choose none for the hazard to keep the stage linear, but change the transform hazard to logarithmic since we are dealing with discharge or outflow. We are also going to need a transform that moves from flow back to stage because the consequences given for PFM2 are a function of stage. Create a tabular transform just like we did prior, but with inputs reversed. X is now flow and value is now stage. The hazard type is flow in CFS and the transformed hazard is stage in feed. With the hazard and transform relationships built, it is time to add a system response by right clicking on the system response folder and selecting from the menu. The most common way will be to add an event tree response, but other options include parametric response, tabular response, and composites. Template event trees for many common failure modes have been preloaded into RMC Total Risk to speed up building a risk analysis. In the dialog box, type in the name of the PFM, select the hazard category, flood or seismic, and then choose a template. PFM1 in this example is backward erosion piping, so we will choose backward erosion piping from the drop down list and click OK. The software will import the typical backward erosion piping event tree into the tab document window. To start inputting data into the event tree, first click on the fan symbol at the first node. This is where the hazard levels used to define the system response will be input. Copy the stages from the homework file and paste them into the properties window to the right. Also, while we are over here, change probability transform to logarithmic so the software will perform semi-log interpolation when interpolating from the system response. Linear for stage, logarithmic for probability.
Next, we copy the Node 1 triangular distribution data from the homework file. Then click on Node 1 branch of the event tree. A system response table will be ready for input in the properties window. Choose triangular for the distribution and paste the Node 1 data into the table. Repeat the process for the second node as shown here, and then for all remaining nodes in the event tree. This one is a deterministic node. Once finished inputting the data for all nodes, click on Response to view the system response relationship. The mean system response is plotted along with the 90% confidence. Repeat this process to input the system responses for the other potential failure modes. Right-click on System Response to add an event tree system response. PFM2 is concrete line spillway erosion. And the event tree will look like this. Copy the spillway discharges that define the system response from the homework file. Click on the fan icon next to spillway discharge at the beginning of the tree, then paste the values into the properties window under the hazard levels. Be sure to change the hazard type to flow, the units to CFS, and both the hazard and probability to logarithmic for the hazard transform, because we are working with flow and system response probabilities. Copy the node data and paste the distribution data into each corresponding event tree branch. Once finished, the system response plot should look like this. Repeat the general process one last time to add an event tree for PFM3 overtopping. Choose the Embankment Overtopping Erosion Template and input the data from the homework file like we've done before. As with the other failure modes, copy the stage data and paste it into the Properties window. Do the same for the node data to fill out the event tree. Because this is an overtopping failure mode, leave both interpolation transform inputs as none for linear interpolation. Once finished, the system response plot for PFM3 overtopping will look like this. The next step is to add in the consequences. Right click on the consequences folder and choose tabular consequence for this example. RMC Total Risk also allows the user to input consequence functions directly from LifeSim. We will need several consequence functions. The first is for the non-breach day life loss. Choose a PERT distribution from the drop-down at the top. Be the non-breach day life loss data from the homework file and paste it into the table in the tab documents window to get this plot. Now repeat for the non-breach night life loss. Copy and paste the non-breach night life loss data from the homework file. You will have to do this one in two steps because the stage is not right next to the night life loss portion of the table like it was for the day. The plot of the non-breach night life loss is shown here. Next, we need to weight the life loss functions by their associated exposure probabilities using a composite function. Right-click on the Consequences folder and select Add Composite Consequence. Name it Non-Breach or something similar. 
In the Properties window, press the first icon with the green plus sign twice to add rows for two consequence functions. Select Non-Breach Day for the first input and Non-Breach Night for the second input. We are told to assume a 10-hour workday, so the day exposure is equal to 10 divided by 24, or 0.417 and the night exposure is equal to 14 divided by 24, or 0.583. Once the exposure weights have been input, the exposure weighted consequences will be plotted as shown. Repeat this process for the breach life loss associated with each potential failure mode. Here is the day life loss for PFM1. The night life loss for PFM1. And the exposure weighted life loss for PFM1. The same procedure is followed for the other PFMs as well. Here is the day life loss for PFM2. The night life loss for PFM2. and the exposure weighted life loss for PFM2. Finally, the day life loss for PFM3, the night life loss for PFM3, and the exposure weighted composite for PFM3. Now that we have inputs for all parts of the risk equation, it is time to build a risk analysis. Right-click on Risk Analysis and choose Add Risk Analysis. Click the plus sign in the top left and select Hazard to start building the risk diagram or project event tree. Use the drop-down to select Stage Frequency. Then click on the yellow circle to add consequence and system response functions. The first connection to the hazard will be the non-breach consequences, so choose Add Consequence and choose Non-Breach from the drop-down. Next, add the PFM starting with PFM1. Click the same yellow circle as before and choose Response. Then select PFM1 from the drop-down menu. Add a consequence function for PFM1. And select PFM1 Breach. The process for PFM2 is a bit different because a transform is needed to go from stage to spillway discharge. Click on the yellow circle and choose Add Transform. Select Stage to Spillway Discharge, then build out the rest of the tree. Add the PFM2 response next, then another transform to convert discharge back to stage and then to the consequences, which are a function of stage in this example. Add in the response and consequences for PFM3, and the risk diagram is complete. Before running the analysis, double check the message window. We have no errors, but several warnings. These warnings are typical and are related to the hazard relationship starting at elevations lower than the lowest stage evaluated for the consequences. The stages are close enough to each other that these warnings can be ignored, but it's always best to define consequence and system response relationships for the full range of loading. Before running the analysis, let's check the properties options. Set the realizations to 10,000 to get a good estimate of the uncertainty. We were instructed in the homework file to use the competing risk model, so choose that option from the failure mode method.
Everything is ready to run. Click back on the General tab of the Properties window. Select Simulation Risk with Full Uncertainty and click Estimate. It should only take a minute or so for the analysis to complete. Many of the terms in RMZ Total Risk are different than the dam safety terms that we are used to. Under Risk Types, there are five options to choose from. Incremental, Background, Total, Failure, and Non-Failure. Incremental refers to the incremental risk for the project. Background refers to the non-breach risk. Total refers to the residual risk. Failure plots the annual probability of failure with the total breach consequences instead of the incremental, and non-failure is the complement of the failure with associated non-fail consequences. The loss exceedance curve is more commonly known as the Big FN chart and is shown here. Here is the non-breach or background loss exceedance curve. and the curve for the total or residual risk. The FN plot for the example, titled Alpha Eta in the software, is shown here. We were only given life loss consequence data, but had we been given economic cost data and wanted to calculate the economic risk, the changes would be to swap out the life loss functions for the economic cost functions in the risk diagram and run a separate risk analysis. You can also view a summary table of the results to see the total risk. You can also pull in the marginal risk associated with each potential failure mode by clicking on Risk Analyses and Failure Modes. On the Alpha Eta tab, you can plot the marginal risk of the PFMs along with the total by following a similar procedure. That plot is shown here. From the Diagnostics tab, you can view a variety of helpful plots and pull out the tabular output data from a risk analysis after it was run. This completes example 6.1. Example 6.2 takes what we just built for example 6.1 and adds gate and operability. To account for gate inoperability, we need to add a stage frequency relationship for each inoperability scenario, and then we need to combine them into a single composite. So for the hazards, we include a tabular hazard for zero gates inoperable. Once the data is pasted in, for the composite to work right at the upper stages, we need to extend each curve to the left by adding one more point. Click the icon with the green plus to add a row. Type in a stage ever so slightly higher than the highest stage and type in a very low number for each percentile. For this example, one times 10 to the minus 16 was used. Repeat this process to bring in the tabular hazard for one gate inoperable. Again, adding a point to the end to extend the curve to the right. And again for two gates inoperable. And again for three gates inoperable. Next, we need to add a composite hazard to combine the gate inoperability relationships. Right-click on Hazard and choose Add Composite Hazard. Press the icon with the green plus until there is four rows in the table in the Properties window. Use the drop-down to select the inoperability scenarios in order. Copy the gate inoperability scenario probabilities. and paste them into the table under weights to complete the composite hazard. 
Please keep in mind that when using composite hazards, the system response for each failure mode must be consistent across all hazard scenarios. Also, because we are working with a composite hazard, we now need transforms that relate to the composite stage. That data is typically only available inside of the software, so we will export the hazard series data by clicking on the arrow icon beneath the camera icon. In the exported CSC file, find the mean zero gates column and the mean Y column. These are the data sets we will need to create the transform for composite stage to zero gates inoperable so we can properly calculate the background or non-breach risk. Add a column next to the mean Y column in the table. Interpolate from the mean X and mean Y zero gates inoperable data using the mean X data in column N. If you want to use the interpolation macro, you will have to import it into the spreadsheet. Use zlinint to interpolate. The first input in the interpolation function is cell N2, followed by the X array from column B, then the Y array from column C. The next input is a negative one because the data is in descending order. The final input is a zero because we do not want to extrapolate. If we have locked the row and column of the X and Y arrays, we can drag that formula down to complete the relationship. Here is the completed columns. Back in RMC Total Risk, create a tabular transform for composite stage to zero gates and operable stage. The hazard type should be stage for both, and the unit should be feet for both. Copy the relationship we just developed. And paste it into the deterministic table in Total Risk. Before having what we need to run the risk analysis, we need one more set of transforms. This time, the transforms are to go from composite stage to spillway discharge and back. This data is provided in the homework file. Here is the tabular transform from composite stage to spillway discharge. Be sure to get the hazard type and unit right in the properties window. And here is the spillway discharge to composite stage transform. We now have what we need to build out the risk diagram. The structure of the diagram will be similar to what we saw before, but the composite hazard is used. We also have a transform for the non-breach consequences, because non-breach assumes intended operation. We are also using the transforms we just made for PFM2. The FN scatter plot or alpha eta plot should look like this once the risk is simulated with full uncertainty. Debris blockage is set up in the same way as gate inoperability with a composite hazard and the same list of transforms. The one thing that is different is how to calculate the probability of debris blockage from the CDFs that are typically estimated. We covered this previously in Module 3 and we'll cover it again here with a quick example. First, we need the average probability across all stages for a given debris blockage scenario. We can then take the formula to calculate that probability and drag it down to complete the same calculation for the other scenarios. Next, we need the average cumulative probability of the midpoint debris blockage scenarios. This will be done across all stages. So, we will take the average probability of having greater than 0% blockage 
and average that with the average probability of having greater than 10% blockage. Next, we will take the average probability of having greater than 10% blockage and average that with the average probability of having greater than 25% blockage. Then we will take the average probability of having greater than 25% blockage and average that with the average probability of having greater than 50% blockage. The probabilities in the completed table are shown here. We now have what we need to calculate the probability of each debris blockage scenario. Start by subtracting the average probability of greater than 5% blockage from the average probability of greater than 0% blockage. Then subtract the average probability of greater than 17.5% blockage from the average probability of greater than 5% blockage. Then subtract the average probability of greater than 37.5% blockage from the average probability of greater than 17.5% blockage. And finally, subtract the average probability of greater than 50% blockage from the average probability of greater than 37.5% blockage. These calculated probabilities should sum to 1 and will be used as weights to create a composite hazard for debris blockage. From there, the procedure and setup are essentially the same as what we covered in the prior example for gate inoperability. In our final example, we will compute the risk for a seismic embankment failure mode, which will be a function of two hazards. Create a tabular function for the stage duration is shown here. Select none for both hazard and probability for the interpolation transforms to interpolate linearly. The stage duration is the primary hazard for a seismic failure mode. Next, we need to calculate seismic weights so we can build out the event tree. The AEPs are the PGAs that define the system response and the midpoints between those points have already been given to us and were obtained by interpolating from the seismic hazard, which is the secondary hazard in this analysis. To get the first probability, subtract the AEP for a PGA of 0.125G from the AEP for a PGA of 0.05G. The SRP at a PGA of 0.05G is zero, so there is no need to consider anything less than a PGA of 0.05G. Next, subtract the AEP for a PGA of 0.325G from the AEP for a PGA of 0.125G. Then subtract the AEP for a PGA of 0.565G from the AEP for a PGA of 0.325G. And finish by setting the last probability equal to the AEP of a PGA of 0.565G. The computed probabilities are shown here. Back in RMC total risk, we need to add our event tree to compute the system response. Choose the seismic category, then select embankment deformation. That will give us this tree to start with. The next step is to pull in the reservoir stages to evaluate. See those stages from the homework file. Click on the fan icon next to the reservoir stage and paste those values in under the hazard level. Now is also a good time to set the interpolation transform. We want semi-log interpolation, so the hazard transform will be none and the probability transform will be logarithmic. Next, branches need to be added for each of the four PGAs evaluated. 
Click the green plus sign to add three new branches, such that there is one for each of the four PGAs evaluated and one for the remainder, which captures the probability of a PGA less than 0.05G. Rename each branch in the properties window, one PGA per branch. To finish building out the tree, hover over the red node coming off the first PGA and click Copy All Branches to Clipboard. Hover over the red nodes for the PGAs below and click Paste to build out the rest of the event tree structure. Again, we are copying the set of branches coming off the 0.05G branch and pasting it in for all following PGA branches. Assign a deterministic probability for each PGA branch. The probabilities will come from the seismic hazard partition and weights that we calculated earlier. From here, copy and paste the node data for each branch of the tree. There are a lot of branches, so take your time and be methodical. Be careful to make sure the probabilities are matched with the correct event tree branch. Once all the data is in, the system response plot should look like this. The next step is to pull in the life loss data using tabular and composite functions like we did in the first example. The correct composite non-breach life loss will look like this. and the correct composite breach life loss will look like this. From here, build out the simple risk diagram. The hazard will be the stage duration, which will connect to the non-breach consequences, and then the deformation system response and that failure mode's associated consequences. After running the analysis with full uncertainty, we get this FN scatter plot. And this loss exceedance for big FN plot. Be careful, however, because the background risk that comes from this analysis is not correct and should be ignored. The connection between the stage duration and the non-breach life loss in the risk diagram was needed to compute the incremental consequences, but cannot be used to create the non-breach risk. The non-breach risk must be a function of stage frequency, not stage duration. As such, the total or residual risk that is reported will also be incorrect. To get the correct non-breach risk, create a new tabular hazard for the stage frequency. And paste in the data from the homework file. The uncertain value is probability and the distribution will be per percentile Z. Then, add a new risk analysis for the non-breach that simply ties the stage frequency hazard we just created to the non-breach consequences. Running this analysis will give us the correct plot for the non-breach or background risk. This concludes Module 6 of the course. Please be sure to complete Homework 6 to get credit for completing the module. In Homework 6, you are asked to redo Homework 5 using RMC Total Risk. Once complete, please send your homework to rmctraining at usace.army.mil with the subject as DLS 105 Homework 6 to help us keep track of the submittals. Thanks in advance for your cooperation. If you have trouble with the homework, please reach out through the email address on the screen. We will go over the solution to the homework assignment during the live question and answer portion, which will be in a few weeks. Also, at the end of the live session, you will be asked to take a short quiz so we can give you credit for your participation. If you miss the live session, a recording will be posted to the website and the quiz will stay open until the day of the next live session, so you should have plenty of time to complete it.
Please check the course schedule for other dates and times. Thank you for your attention and we'll catch you back for Module 7.